Welcome to the Georgia State University's first ever Main Street Entrepreneurship Seed Fund Demo Day. If you can say that really fast, 10 yeah, times, give them a round of prize. applause. Give them a round of applause. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're going to get it started right now. Uh, I'm MK. I'm one of the ar uh, entrepreneurs in residence for this program. And with me is Jameen Moton. Jameen, you want to tell who yes. you are? Yes. So my name is Jameen Moton, and I had the privilege of coaching the seed startup companies. What an honor. Pretty amazing. So we have a packed evening in front of us. We're going to hear, we already went through 10, uh, uh, 10 pitches of seed companies and 10 pitches of startup companies, and we picked the top five of each of those categories. Then, now you'll get to hear the story from each of those. But before we go more into it, I want to take the privilege of first you hearing about what this program is really about from some of the people who are behind it. Jimmy. So over the past eight months, they have been on a journey. Uh, starting a business is not easy. A lot of them had made substantial sacrifices to pursue their passion. What an honor. Uh, they have no idea what they've indulged into. <laughs> but this is just the beginning, and what you're going to hear is not only the Main Street story, but the story for each of these entre entrepreneurs. There are several people that have been very critical to this, to this, to this story. Uh, I want to introduce to you our very own President Barker, the president of Georgia State University. Good afternoon and welcome to Georgia State University. Good afternoon! <laughs> you know, it's, it's particularly fitting that we are in this particular venue for uh, this event today. So when you think about where you sit, in 1996, this was the stadium that was home to the Summer Olympic Games. And on this Saturday afternoon, the United States Olympic Marathon trials are going to go right by that flame, right out there, uh, and cat recapture that 96 history. And we will have the flame lit on Saturday for the Olympic trials. So watch the Olympic trials live on, I think, I won't say which network because I'll get it wrong, but be on TV and be Georgia State. But that was 1996. In 1997, it became home of the Atlanta Braves and was home of the Atlanta Braves for a long time. And then in 2017, it became the home of Georgia State football. The story being is that this is a facility that has reinvented itself. It's on its third life, so to speak. Um, we're very proud of this facility, this venue, and what we've been able to do here. But that's the same story and the same history of Georgia State University. Georgia State University traces its roots back to 1913, when, it became, when the evening school of commerce for the Georgia Institute of Technology, but we'll forget about that part, <laughs> established a presence in downtown so the then new science of business could be brought to the working businessmen who had their businesses in downtown Atlanta. Now, just like this stadium has changed, this institution has changed many times. So you think about the three lives of this, Georgia State has much more than three lives, but you start in 1913, as a business school, all the students were white and all the students were men. Georgia State today, 53,000 students, majority minority, and there's more women than there are men. There's been a lot of change. <laughs> One piece that has not changed is that an important part of the heart of Georgia State University has been that the university has always been a place of opportunity and to provide opportunity for individuals to get the education and the launch into business. Okay. Started as a business school, very third largest business school in the country by student enrollment, I believe, Dean Phillips. So very big part of what we do. But now we come around innovation and entrepreneurship, and it's a university now that giving students across the entire institution the opportunity to take their ideas, to develop them with the appropriate leadership of the um, whole program, with mentors, and actually create concepts, build companies, and that's what you're seeing here today is those pitches uh, as well as we've got alumni in the room who are either in the process of starting their own companies or well along. You see Christian Zimmerman back here with Coins, for example, is one of our companies. Christian's a recent alum that has a company that's up and running here in Atlanta. Uh, that's what this is all about, is that the students get that opportunity, and we make that opportunity available to all of our students. 
so that you have the best talent from all of society represented here. These are students, unlike some of the famous cases you know that have gone out of Harvard where people have dropped out of Harvard to start a company like a Microsoft or a Facebook. Those individuals, when they started their companies, if they didn't succeed, they were gonna be fine because they had a safety net underneath them. We can't say that for every Georgia State student. So what's important about this ecosystem, this infrastructure we're building, is to be able to help students who don't have that safe safety net as they get to start their companies, they're gonna build something not having basically a bank account behind them individually. So they have to go out and build their concepts, build their pitches, and attract investors so that they can basically take their great ideas, take them to market, create their own businesses. And so we're very excited to have you here today, and we're very excited to have the support of the Marcus Foundation. Now, Bernie and Billy Marcus are great philanthropists for this city, have done a tremendous amount for the city. And knowing Bernie personally, his commitment to small business and creating new businesses is just a big part of who he is. If you know the Home Depot story, that doesn't surprise you. And so the support of the Marcus Foundation has been huge to get us, getting us to this point. So Marcus, thanks to you and thanks to Bernie and Billy and the entire foundation. So without further ado, <laughs> welcome. Um, you know, take away you know, great ideas and opportunities around the companies. I know you have hard work ahead of you, uh, but also feel free to come back. We'd love to have you back for football games, concerts, uh, whatever we're doing here, and be engaged in Georgia State with whatever way that works for you, for your company, uh, for yourself individually, uh, for people that you know that want to invest in some of the best and brightest talent that the state and city have to offer. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you, President. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you the Director of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Institute, Dr. Jennifer Scher. Well, thank you, Jameen, uh, for the introduction, and, and thanks to President Becker for helping to build the excitement um, that is in the room. So on behalf of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Institute, I am very pleased to welcome you here to our first ever Main Street Entrepreneur Seed Fund Demo Day. So six months ago, we selected 21 companies into the first ever Main Street program um, from nearly 100 applicants. The cohort is made up of Georgia State students, recent alumni, and community members that represent five different colleges, including Perimeter College, and 18 different disciplines or majors at Georgia State University, reflecting that great ideas and good business opportunities can come from anywhere. Built on the hallmarks of intentional and customized mentoring and programming, the Main Street founders have participated in educational workshops, intense, and I mean intense, one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions, with our entrepreneurs and residents and, and many other advisors, some internal and some external. They've dealt with employment disputes. They've dealt with what most entrepreneurs deal with, cash flow issues. They've practiced their pitches in the mid middle of Linux Mall, in the middle of Pond City Market. They've been pushed to the edge. They've been pushed to the edge, and then they've been brought back again. And they've changed their businesses. They've pivoted, they've made significant progress, they've met milestones, they've achieved key performance indicators. Some have even graduated from Georgia State since they started in the program. And they've grown as companies, founders, and individuals. Thanks to the Main Street program, the support of the Marcus Foundation, and the work of many who have helped build the infrastructure at Georgia State, to support entrepreneurs and innovators. We have you here today to witness a, tra the, a transformation that's occurred over the past six months. You'll see businesses that are making our local communities even better places. You'll see businesses that are making our world a better place. You'll see businesses that are disrupting business models and potentially even entire industries. And you're seeing businesses that are making it easier for small businesses to succeed. The future is bright, and the pipeline is strong and growing for programs like Main Street that provide critical support for Georgia State entrepreneurs. The future is bright, and the pipeline is strong for those of you that are investing in companies, are partnering with new and innovative companies. 
and for all of us who are paying attention to what's happening in our local and global economies. Since 2015, Georgia State has launched four new entrepreneurial theme majors and a minor, and we now have over 850 undergraduate students enrolled in these degree programs with no signs of sh slowing down anytime soon. Again, the first of these programs was launched in 2015, and the most recent was launched in the fall of 2019. They are interdisciplinary, bringing together colleges, including the Robinson College of Business, the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies, the College of Arts and Sciences, and institutes like the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Institute, like the Creative Media Industries Institute, and like the Institute for Biomedical Sciences, from across campus to offer degrees and programs that educate students at the intersection of industries and disciplines. Launch GSU, our on-campus incubator for student-led businesses, has over 100 active members from departments and schools all across campus, some of which you'll hear from today. Our entrepreneurs also have access to new venture competitions, such as the H.J. Russell Business Model Competition held at the end of each semester, thanks to a gift dating back to 1999 from the Herman J. Russell family. And entrepreneurs benefit from Georgia State's central location in Atlanta's thriving innovation ecosystem. And they have access to maker spaces like XLab and programs like Digital Learners to Leaders. And the list goes on. So thank you all for being here. We're extremely proud of our founders and, and who have participated in the inaugural Main Street program. Pay attention, get to know them, keep in touch with them, because they will change the world. Awesome, thank you, Jennifer. And for the moment that we've all been waiting for. Are you guys ready? All right, one more round of applause for all of the entrepreneurs. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Give it up for them. There you go. All right, just a little bit of housekeeping. I love my cell phone as much as you do. My team is probably wondering what I'm doing right now. I'm not replying to text messages. So look, if you have to take a call, please silence your phones. Um, please check your phones. There's always that one person where the phone goes off. Check your phones. Make sure your phones are off, okay? And if you have to leave for whatever reason, please do so between the pitches. You guys ready? All right, let's do this. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our phenomenal, phenomenal panel of judges that are here. Remember I told you that they are pitching for uh, an award, and it's a monetary award. So it can truly, truly impact their businesses. All of them have worked very hard to get here. And the judges will be tallying up, I do not want your job. <laughs> but we are glad that you are here today to be a part of this. Our first judge is Brent Waters, uh, CEO of Value Core. So what do I click? On? Sheila Jordan, managing partner of Knowledge oh, Architects. Yeah. And our third judge is Andrew Dorman. He's the partner okay. of No Ventures. Could you give them a round okay. of applause, please? Okay. Thank That's you. I'm saying, is my, is my deck going to come up? In his free time. He does improv in front of audiences across Metro Atlanta. London Balbosa, the CEO of Art Hub. Thanks for having me, everyone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm London Balbosa from Art Hub, and we're creating a global marketplace for independent visual artists and aspiring art buyers seeking to discover, buy, sell, and invest in fine art without breaking the bank. For over a decade, I watched my stepfather struggle to scale his art practice, and that was the most traumatic and memorable experience of my teenage life, as I was an heir to this problem that affected his self-esteem and the income within our home. But it had nothing to do with his talent or marketability, but everything to do with his lack of business acumen, technology, and access to art buyers outside of his region. I have to admit that today, this is the current state for 75% of US artists right here in the US who earn less than $10,000 a year from their art practice, with women and minorities fearing the worst. On the other side of the market, aspiring art buyers face the problem and the misconception that you have to be extremely wealthy to begin collecting your first piece of work. We know all of this because we've spoken with 500 private art collectors, galleries, and museums across the, across the Southeast who have not only vowed that this is a problem that needs to be solved, but have pledged to support us in helping us do that before even having a product. But today, we're happy to announce 
that we're much closer to our dream of creating a platform that will enable aspiring art buyers, whether they're first time, moderate, or a regular collector, to connect to new and emerging works at scale. Our platform will enable visual artists as well as small size art galleries the ability to scale at a greater reach than they are currently, authentication services, and also standard enterprise services to understand the art market in real time. For visual art buyers, first time, moderate, or aspiring, we're offering them access to art that they wouldn't necessarily find anywhere else. How it works is simple. An artist uploads their work. We use proprietary technologies to match their work with a buyer. We take 20% of the sale, and all the artist has to do is print the label and ship it. We're currently operating in a $68.7 billion market, with the US economy currently driving $29.9 billion of it. But we're targeting millennial online art buyers who are currently driving $2.2 billion of this market, with 93% of them driving online art sales, and 61% of them driving art sales at less than $5,000. What, what differentiates our product is that we're offering um, new and emerging works, a low-cost service to art buyers, and uh, small galleries, and then also transparency. Our team is diversified, and we have sales and marketing, as well as business development support. We're seeking a pre-seat round of $250,000 to launch our platform right here in the, uh, Atlanta, metro Atlanta area, and partner with a local art gallery to uh, build out a pilot and to build out our proprietary technology to make this all possible. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to working with you. What did you do to validate that customers would, or that the artists would allow you to take 20%? We've spoken with them. And we've spoken with them. Art Basel, we went to the largest art fair in the world uh, in Miami in December, and we were able to speak with over um, a thousand actually, but 500 of them uh, to really give us the insights that we needed to validate that they were looking for a better solution than what the galleries are offering them. Um, we're offering 10 to 20 percent. Art galleries offer uh, art galleries uh, margins. Uh, they tap into like 50 to 60 percent of an artist's margins, and so we're offering them everything that they would need um, to scale um, to do so. Yeah. So today, we actually, um, our product, our MVP, is developed and up and running. Um, and we have about 50 artworks on the uh, 50 artists represented on the site right now. Um, we have uh, two partnerships in the works with um, local art galleries. And our next step is to um, reach out to interior designers and local real estate you know, people to get the art into, the, in, into these homes and, um, and also attend art fairs to, you know, um, spread the word um, here locally. How are you going to, uh, I guess, how do you see the relationship with art galleries developing over time if you're taking commission and they're also taking commission? Well, the thing most people don't realize is that um, if an art gallery isn't selling an artist's work, they are forced to liquidate that work. And so they have a warehouse full of work. So one of our, actually one of the galleries that we're partnered with, Lanique, they have a problem with, um, you know, not being able to liquidate their art fast enough. So it's in a warehouse and storage facility sitting there, not making any money so as a result of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We take 10 between 20, 10 to 20, depending on how much work we have to put in to, to, to facilitate the sale. Yeah. How do you decide what is allowed on your site? Curators. And, and proprietary technology, AI is going to help us do that. Thank you, London. Thank you. Fluent in Arabic. I killed it. <laughs> and he's an identical twin. Usama Muta Ali, CEO of Bukhari Tutoring and Health. Good afternoon. My name is Usama Muta Ali, and I'm the founder of Bukhari Tutoring and Health, 
We are a nonprofit STEM-based tutoring, mentorship, and health organization striving to promote academic success. I started this company because growing up, I never really had any educational support or academic assistance. I was failing classes throughout middle school and high school, and this really discouraged me. Uh, so I started getting into drugs and crime. Things started to escalate, and some of my friends were sent to prison, and some of my friends were shot. So I told myself, I want to change myself for the better, and I want to change my community. I started doing some research, and I discovered that only 19% of high school students in Atlanta managed to receive a bachelor's degree. So Bukhari Tutoring and Health is here to raise those percentages amongst high school students and get more high school students to graduate college by providing three essential services. After school homework assistance and tutoring, sports programs, and skill development programs. Our skill development programs are IT-based, so students come and learn different, um, different uh, coding languages, also networking programs, as well as cybersecurity, et cetera. So we're trying to change the lives of 15.6 million high school students nationwide, but first we're gonna concentrate our efforts on the 36,000 students in DeKalb County. We offer a subscription-based service, so it's $150 a month for unlimited tutoring and homework assistance, $100 a month for our sports programs, and the prices for our skill development programs range from $200 to $2,500. Because of this, we completely blow our competition out of the water. We are the most affordable tutoring company in Atlanta as we beat the prices of Kumon tutoring and varsity tutors by more than 80%. We offer a variety of subjects to be taught. We offer skill development programs. We offer sports programs. And most of all, we're very involved in our community as we bring awareness to drugs and crime and the importance of receiving an education. It's been a great journey so far. Before we started, we were in an empty office space with only 13 students teaching four subjects, one skill development program, and one partnership. But we've definitely scaled. Now we have a fully furnished tutoring center with 50 students coming in and out on a daily basis, teaching 10 subjects, five skill development programs, and six partnerships. And from our greatest accomplishments is that we were able to raise enough money for a, uh, for a down payment on a 12,000 square foot building with 13 classrooms that can hold up to 250 students um, at once, this building is going to serve as a, also as an incubator space and a co-working space for local entrepreneurs as well. And this all would have not been possible without my co-founder, Mohammed Abdul Hakim, computer science major, genius, certified hustler, philanthropist, <laughs> and humanitarian. And what we're looking for is 10 companies who want to donate $1,000 a month to help keep our philanthropic efforts alive so we can... Um, add more programs to the community, and bring real value to the Stone Mountain Atlanta community. So I want, I want to uh, thank the Georgia State uh, University and the Main Street Entrepreneurship Seed Fund for allowing me to be a part of this great, uh, this, great to have me, this great opportunity. And I want to remind you all to be a part of the academic revolution that's going to change Atlanta. Thank you. So you talked a little bit about I think you, used, you talked a little bit about uh, uh, volunteer I mean, don donations. Do you have a revenue model? Uh, a revenue model? Um, so, like how else are you going to generate? Revenue? Oh, so we um we charge for our tutoring for to, through the tuition. And we also do fun, different fundraisers. We've been doing that with the seed fund money that we got. We, we, we did a couple of fundraisers. And we've just been pushing and uh, trying to just raise money and try to bring real value to the community. We also look for sponsors from like Jordan and Nike. I know that Chase Bank as well supports educational nonprofits. And uh, the North Face does, as well as many other companies. So this is what we're aiming for as well, yes. Who's the target audience? Uh, the sto uh, high school students in particular, but we also accept middle school students and elementary students. Those with capital or the ability to pay subscription? What if they don't have the ability to pay? Um, so we're going to, that's, that's, uh, that's why we're trying to look for donations to help sponsor their, um, their uh, tutoring, after school tutoring. Are there any uh, accreditation or regulatory hurdles you need to clear in order to continue to mature with um, not not right now but we are going to uh, try to get become a certified educational facility in the state of Georgia we're, <laughs> we're going for that partnership right now yes awesome thank you you're welcome her favorite sport is basketball and she's a lover of poetry EcoDrop CEO, Nicole Toole. Hello, my name is Nicole Toole, and I'm the CEO of EcoDrop. In 2018, six college students came together to solve a huge problem, 
pollution. You see, we understood that pollution is a growing issue on our planet and that recycling is a solution to the problem. But according to the EPA, only 34% of all recyclables are actually recycled in the United States. We have one of the lowest recycling rates when compared to other developed nations. But to make matters even worse, in 2018, China banned the importation of plastic from countries across the globe, which put America into a frenzy because we never even considered creating the appropriate infrastructure to take care of our own waste. America's recycling system has three central problems. It produces highly contaminated materials, it's extremely costly, and it has very low participation rates. EcoDrop is a reverse vending machine in an application that tracks and rewards recycling. How it works is users insert plastic bottles and aluminum cans in exchange to get points on our application that can be used to redeem products and services within their community. Our solution increases recycling rates through incentives while also ensuring the collection of contamination-free materials. Our current target market is colleges and universities. There are currently 5,300 colleges and universities within the US, and upon deploying our technology, technology on 30% of this market, we have the opportunity of opening a, one point, a $57 million market. But we believe our potential is much greater than this. We want to go into grocery stores, shopping centers, and other public places, which opens us up to a $1.8 billion total addressable market. Our key competitors are Tomer and Avipco, both of which use cash back reward model systems. But this model is only viable within 10 states within the US because these states have bottle deposit laws. These are laws that allow for citizens to receive cash back on the recyclables that they turn in. But because there's only 10 bottle deposit law states in the US, this limits their scope and influence. But because we utilize reward based models, we can go into every state and country worldwide. We receive revenue through the leasing of our machines as well as through the sale of our recyclables. Our machines lease for $12,000 per machine per year and our recyclables sell for roughly 40 cents per pound. Our key costs include the collection and hauling services we provide and the manufacturing of each machine. Before Main Street, we were still in the ideation stages of development. But after Main Street, we completed customer discovery on 10 college campuses and talked to over 300 students about their recycling habits. We also held recycling days on Georgia State's campus in which we allowed for students to turn in plastic bottles and aluminum cans in exchange for physical coupons to restaurants that we partnered with on campus. We had an incredible turnout and clicked over 2,000 materials and had over 100 users in less than 32 hours. We also completed the first iterations of our application and machine, which we plan to test on Georgia State's campus this spring. And none of this could have been done without my incredible team, which includes myself and my partner, Ishir Vasavara, our tech team, as well as our two amazing advisors. Though we've made a lot of progress, we still have a ways to go. We are currently raising $300,000 in order to build upon our current technology and to deploy, deploy onto three college campuses. And we invite you to help us to truly create a green economy. Thank you. Great, great job, Nicole. Can you go back to the slide with the, the machine on it and the, the unit economics, I guess? Yes. So are you guys leasing the machine? And yes. So you're collecting 12K per year? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. So it's less than a 12-month payback here than the cost of building the machine? Correct. Um, say that again when we're fine. So it costs 8000 to build. Correct. In year one, you take in 12. Mm -hmm. Then who's going to lease the machines? So we lease the machines out to colleges, to university yeah. campuses. Mm -hmm. and, and how much can they generate? So, like I said in the presentation, it's 40 cents per pound. So our machines can hold up to 800 to 1,000 materials, which translates to roughly 3,000, um, or actually less than that, sorry, um, per year. So um, that's, so we have a gross margin of roughly 42%, um, or yeah, 42% per machine in the first year, because um, it's recurring revenue. All right. So how many machines are you planning to put out in that first year? Right, so this year um, we're piloting, we want to pilot on Georgia State's campus. So that'll be our first fully manufactured machine. Next year we want to start piloting on Georgia Tech and Emory. Um, and then from there we're going to spread to other universities in Georgia. How does it scale? You're putting in, doesn't the person put in one item at a time? Yes, sir. How does it allow them to scale or to recycle 50 cans? Right, so as of right now, we only have one hole, so it's, it's one can at a time. Um, but we are looking into other methods in order so people can put in multiple recyclables in the bin. Um, but as of right now, it's only one that can be entered. 
What kind of labor does it take to pick up all the materials? Yeah, so good question. So we are planning to have student ambassadors on each campus who do all the collection for us. So they'll take the, the recyclables from each machine and take it to a central location, and then we'll have our haulers come at least twice a month to pick up the materials. Have you val validated that people will actually recycle for, if you will, a discount coupon at some place as opposed to cash? Yeah, so we have. So the, we went on this last semester, we allowed for students to turn in plastic bottles and aluminum cans in exchange for physical coupons that we, with restaurants we partnered with. Um, and so that helped us prove the model, but we're still in the process of doing that. Um, but just with the um, success in that, um, we are confident that it'll be able, it'll be popular on multiple campuses. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. He's an avid fan of Lord of the Rings, as well as Futurama. That's such a hard question. CEO of Observe, Nishant Sinha. Hi, everyone, judges. My name is Nish Sinha, and this is Observe. Do you remember what you wanted to be when you were growing up? Do you remember what you wanted to major in in college? If you face the struggle of deciding your career, you're not alone. In fact, career indecision is an epidemic. Three quarters of all students will change their major at least once before they graduate, wasting $10,000 every semester they do. That's a lot of cash burnt. And two thirds of students will face hopelessness because of that. And that's not just a problem for students either. In fact, it's a global problem for companies. Recruiters have a problem acquiring and retaining top talent because students don't know what they're passionate about. They don't know what careers they'll fit into. And there are solutions, but they're too broad and inefficient. Students go to family and friends or career services, but they might not have the knowledge about what careers the students are actually passionate about. So students go to the web. They go to YouTube and Snapchat and LinkedIn. But again, these aren't centralized sources of insight. What students need is a vision. They need to go from point A, the skills and passion that they have, to point B, careers and jobs. They need direction and clarity. And that's where Observe comes in. What we are is a digital job shadowing platform as well as a recruitment platform all tied together. On the left, you can see what we call the exploration orb. What that is, is it relates similar careers together so that you can explore your interest in real time. We pair that with something called Ask Me Anything, similar to Reddit's, and we also give professionals the ability to respond with videos so that they're not just talking about what they're doing, they're showing you. For professionals, this creates a digital resume, but it's designed by students for students. And that's what makes us different. Students spend less time on our platform, but get way more value out of it because we're a centralized source of insight. We're dedicated to helping students figure out what career is right for them. We're not just sharing achievements, we're sharing career journeys. And our market's massive. Over $100 billion per year is spent by students changing their major. And we know how we're gonna tap into it. We know 11.3 million students change their major every year. 10% of them go off and do great things, about 20% drop out, but we're targeting that middle 70% who change their major again and again through our marketing and advertisement <laughs> campaigns. And here's how we make money. We offer a freemium subscription, so our platform's free to use to a degree, after which we charge $8 per month per user. We're targeting businesses, this is business to business, for unlimited use. We also give data analytics to these companies about students and other professionals on the platform. Now before we joined Main Street, we were just an idea. We had won some awards and competitions, some of which even took us across the country, like to Minneapolis and DC. We had great accolades from companies like Google and Fujitsu, and even from a co-founder at Craigslist. But with Main Street, we've really gone from an idea to a product. We've iterated by talking to over 500 aspiring professionals, conducting 57 surveys, and we have 92 beta testers right now. But we're still looking for more help. We need partners to actually use Observe. We're also looking for 200,000 in funding for those things, and we're trying to increase our runway to about 16 months. Here's the team that's making it happen. It's Lawrence, myself, Chi Chi, and Philip. And with that, are there any questions? You said you're business to business, but it really is targeting individuals that need to know, uh, try to discover their path forward. Is that accurate? What am I missing? Yes, yeah, so we are business to business. We're trying to get businesses onto the platform so that their professionals will actually join. We're targeting institutions like colleges, tutoring centers, and universities, um, as well as large companies so that we can get their professionals, but also the students, because it is a chicken and egg problem that we're trying to deal with, which is why that funding will really help us. Why will they join the businesses? Uh, so for businesses, it gives better 
insight for recruiters. They're making more informed career decision, more informed hiring, sorry. Um, so they're actually able to see how professionals interact with each other. Um, if they're trying to hire a consultant, they don't just see what the consultant's end product is. They're seeing how they interact with other customers, they're seeing how they interact with their clients, and they're able to see how they'll actually work with the business once they hire them. Okay, would there be lots of turnover in the paying users, therefore? I mean, as they, as they discover what they want to do, don't they go away? We understand that is a potential problem, but we also see us growing as a platform from this. This is our first steps. So yes, but also we want to create more content and give more of a reason for people to stay on our platform than just what we have presented today. So how, how did you decide on the $8 per month per user number, and who's paying that? Um, so companies will be paying that, or institutions, so colleges, universities, and the like, which I described. Um, and we decided on that by talking to those, those over 500 aspiring professionals. Um, we met them on random forums. We met them on the street. We talked to them in games. And we decided on that number, trying to figure out what the max people will pick. And then we chose a number and went around asking if you'll actually pay for that. Um, well, and how so much you said pay. the businesses are paying the $8. Yes. But you asked the professionals, which would be the people who are, just like, are they the ones looking for the jobs or are they the ones looking for candidates? Businesses will be looking for other candidates, but the people on our platform. Um, are, are, they, are they the professionals? Yes. So you asked professionals what they would pay, but someone else would be paying it. That is correct. Okay. Um, we decided on that number by asking those professionals, um, but we are going to be charging businesses that number. Um, and we decided that's a fair number to choose. Um, again, that might change once we actually yeah. do ask businesses, but um, <laughs> we are aware that, um, that that is a potential issue. Yeah. $8 is what we decided on from um, our research. Gotcha, thank awesome. you. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. All right, last but not least, did you know she was a triplet? She's got seven <laughs> brothers and sisters. And she is the CEO of Self Academy, Janella Gunu. Hi, everyone. My name is Janella Gunu. I am the CEO and founder of, of Students Expressing Life Through Fashion. When I was 15 years old, I had always dreamed about going to, to SCAD. However, my time there was, was cut due to the, to the tuition costs. And I noticed that I, I wasn't alone and that out of the fashion colleges in Georgia, that more people were getting in rather than actually um, graduating. Due to the average cost after aid. And then I, I ended up transferring to Georgia uh, State to pursue a business degree. And I noticed that the local sewing classes didn't truly help with, des with designer needs. And so I created a self um, afterward. And when I had launched, we only had eight members one teacher who was actually me and three equipment and this is us today we have over 300 members however we are currently um, operating on Georgia state premises and is looking to and we are looking to um, open our own uh, studio. We also have 30 equipment, um, 11 mannequins, 10 partners, and a t team of teachers who are 
willing to teach um, menswear and women's wear. And these are our members as well. We are asking for 500,000 to open up the first 24 seven intimate design um, studio in Atlanta, Georgia. And our competitors have nothing on us, being that they only, they have like at all. <laughs> they, they only offer courses, events, and coupons, okay. Well, we actually offer direct um, mentors, a 24-7 um, uh, studio, and online market place for our members to, um, to, to put their works on, and industry placements. And so we are asking to help us to make this happen. Thank you. Oh, hi. 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 Who, who is your target market, and what's the market size, do you think? Yes. Um, we, we currently have three different members. The first one is people that are enrolled in non-arts colleges that are looking to learn um, basic um, info on design. And so we actually tested it out on campus. And we currently have 92 members in, in, the, in the six months um, uh, Huh. Span. <laughs> um, we also have our our next member that is looking to only learn, and then our apprentice member is trying to get into the fashion industry. And our partners are here to help them on that. Of course, our teachers too. How yes. do you plan to scale it? We were so. The idea is to is to is to open th this up to anyone, and so that could be those that can't afford fashion colleges like me, to um, teachers that are wanting to teach, and of course um, new graduates of fashion colleges that are looking for um, jobs as well, and so they can actually teach. Um, and then of course, um, our online market, that is to, to our members to, um, to, to market their products. Um, yes, to answer your question. Yeah. So, uh, great job, Janella. Uh, Thank you. I guess Thank my you. question is, how will you help the people who work in your studios progress beyond just getting the basic skill set? Are you going to help them maybe find that next step in their career, or do you see this being something they stick around at for a while? That's actually a great question. Um, <laughs> um, so all of our teachers, they, are, they have um, a experience in Fashion Week, Paris Fashion Week, London as well. So they're just trying to come in and teach, being that they also know people that can't afford fashion colleges. And so um, though, though we would like to um, offer them opportunities, they, they don't want it. And I'm like, OK, cool. So, <laughs> Thank you, guys. All right. In, uh, in 2009, uh, when I was raising capital for my own startup, 
uh, someone asked me, an investor asked me, uh, hey, MK, are you a tech grad or a Georgia grad? And I told him, I'm a state grad. And none other than Robinson College of Business alumni. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you Dean Richard D. Phillips of the Robinson College of Business. Good afternoon, everyone. So I, I, I feel a little uh, behind uh, all these great pitches that you're hearing up here. I'm not sure we're going to be able to um, give the same set of uh, excitement that they've been doing for you today. So, um, but let me say thank you for coming today and uh, give you a warm welcome from us here at the Robinson College. Um, I wanted to pick up the theme uh, just for a couple of minutes that Mark um, started with earlier today, which is the reinvention of the university and talk just for a minute about the reinvention of the business school. You're seeing it here today. Um, the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Institute that's putting on what you're seeing here today was a dream just three or four years ago. Um, back uh, uh, four years ago, it was an entrepreneurship program inside the management department. And it had 50 students that ran through that program at that time. And as Jennifer said, um, uh, just a few, uh, at the, before these five um, companies came up and pitched, Today, there's over 900 students that are somehow seeking a degree in entrepreneurship at Georgia State, and we'll see over 2,500 students go through one of our entrepreneurship classes in just this year. And just by changing the way that we think about entrepreneurship at Georgia State and the way we've organized the courses and the programs, we've really reinvented how that happens at Georgia State. And it hasn't just um, been in our entrepreneurship programming at Georgia State and at Robinson how we're thinking about reinventing the business school. We've also thought about that in um, how it is that we're thinking about innovating um, for businesses more generally. And the other major investment that we've made over the last five years is something we call the Institute for Insight. And we've been bringing the engineering disciplines into the business school that are reinventing the world around us, that are thinking about um, data science and analytics and the technologies that are enhancing the digital revolution and thinking about bringing those into the business school and partnering with our finance faculty, our strategy faculty, our marketing faculty, and thinking about the applications of those technologies and the convergence of those technologies in new business applications and new business models. Um, and training students for the bi digital businesses of the future. And in, uh, <clears throat> in all of that, we've been building new experiential learning opportunities and building applied innovation labs so that we can help businesses and partner with businesses in order to be able to invent their future. Um, I encourage you to learn what it is that we're doing by going to our website and taking a look at it. And these students that are going through these programs here today are emblematic of the types of programs that we're putting together. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for seeing what it is that we're doing. Thank you very much for learning about what's happening at Georgia State. And I encourage you to pay attention to the next five companies that will come up here, and I'm sure you'll be as impressed with them as you have with the five companies you've seen so far. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dean Phillips. All right. We got five women, young women, in there ready to tell your story. How awesome is that? We picked top five, and they are all women. All right. Gay, you know, it really feels good to be a girl dad right now. <laughs> anyway, first up is Savannah Sample, founder and CEO of Angel Assistance. Now, this is what Savannah tells me. Apparently, she's got the best folding technique in the industry. I don't know about that. We'll see. Give it up. It just switch. Hi. How are y'all? My name is Savannah, and I'm the founder of Angel Assistance. I started college here back in 2012 on a scholarship in Dreams, and shortly after realized that I was going to need to get a job if I was going to stay in Atlanta. But I needed a job that was flexible around my school schedule, and I knew I loved working with children. So I started nannying. I started working with two families, and that grew by word of mouth to working with 12 families, seven days a week while going to school full time. And I realized that all of these families had the same problem. There was overpiled laundry, dishes were piled up, toy rooms were messy, and the kids weren't getting the quality time they needed with their parents because the parents were working on getting the house done. 
The person this affects the most in the household usually is the mother. The mother's the one managing the kids' schedules and the household tasks, and she's the one stressing out the most to get all of these things done. I did some research and realized there's really nothing on the market that provided a service like this, except for individuals like me that were going above and beyond as nannies. So I decided to create my own service. Angel Assistance is a family assistance service that tackles the daily to-dos, including child and animal care. We charge $23 to $28 an hour. Our angel pay starts at $15 an hour, and that brings in $5 to $13 an hour. Our target market, we've discovered, are two-parent households. There are 76 million two-parent households in the United States, and over a million of those alone are in Georgia. Just in Atlanta, there's over 67,000 two-parent households. We are currently located in and around these areas of Atlanta, Georgia, and we've been requested in these cities multiple times across the United States. When we started Main Street, we started with one employee, which was me, doing everything overhead. Um, we had five angels and 13 families. Since beginning Main Street, we now have four employees with delegated tasks. We have nine angels, and we've almost doubled our clientele with an average customer value of $900 a month. Not only that, we got to partner with one of our angel moms who does graphic design that rebranded us from cute little logo to sleek and sophisticated. We partnered with Grantland and Lawn Care and Helix Deep Cleaning Services to provide a full helping hand for your household, as well as eNanny Source who runs our background checks and driving records on each angel. We also are creating a perks program for our clients and we started with these four companies below. These three companies below, sorry. We are raising $200,000 to help grow and scale in these four areas. We're not only raising money, we are searching for a seasoned mentor that's specifically interested in our market to help us along our journey. Are you our angel? Thank you. How have you validated this works for the customer? You only have, you have nine angels today? Yes. So uh, how, have you had enough experience to validate that it works and that it can scale? Yes. We actually have the issue of not having enough angels. Um, we have a waiting list normally with clients, and we only have one client that's left. So does that point out a problem? How, how do you bring angels on, and what's the, what's the, what's the problem in bringing more angels on? Um, we are trying to, since we, I'm very personal with my business, and I'm very, I love all of our families, I'm very particular on who we hire, so I'm wanting to create a more training boot camp that helps angels, like a two-week boot camp, to help them and train them in the process. Um, so we find angels from college campuses, Facebook groups, a lot of Facebook sponsorships, stuff like that, um, to run ads. Yes, so right now we have three interviews we do. Um, we have an application interview. Um, application, we have over the phone and in-person interview. Um, and then we do on-site training. We have a few families that have offered graciously to help us train on-site. Um, since we do everything, it's kind of hard to train someone off-site. We need someone kind of on the job. That runs about two weeks, and then we assign them to two to three families each. Yes, so the reason that one family left is because we had scheduling issues with our app we were using. Um, there's sometimes the schedules wouldn't publish, the angel wouldn't show up, and it happened several times to where the mom was just like, just forget it, like it's just too frustrating to have someone not show up. Um, and we're currently using, we moved apps in this app called Tanda, who does our scheduling and clock in and out and GPS location for us. However, it's not the personalized version that we need because the lingo confuses our clients. So our clients are seen as managers on the app, and they're like, I'm not a manager, I'm just a family. So we can't find an app that's personalized just for us to use to help get angels, assign angels, clock in and out, payment, everything. Yes, um, so we started um, last year, 2018, it was a little over $50,000. Um, this year was around $120,000. So if we keep scaling, we'll be around a quarter of a million next year. Hi. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Ashley Daramola handling art, mental health, mental well-being um, through creative art. Ashley.
Ashley Garamola, co-founder and CEO of Art Bella. Hi, I'm Ashley Duramola, founder of Artsy Bella Studio and Shop. Our mission is to empower people to live creatively, using the artistic process as a stress relieving tool. I was born and raised in Southwest Atlanta, and at an early age, I had to find creative ways to express and cope with stress. From experiencing a troubled childhood to overcoming abuse as an adult, having access to art in many ways saved my life. I found the same to be true in my 10 year work as a mental health professional during which time I obtained a master's in psychology. Mental health is becoming a lucrative industry, with the world acknowledging the economic burden it has on our global economy. One in five US adults experience mental illness each year, making it perhaps one of the most significant crises of our time, yet half of that population isn't seeking help. So we developed the Bella Box, a monthly subscription box to help people start their journey towards better mental health in a fun, easy, and creative way. Each box comes with two art activities every month, a Set the Mood Starter Kit, and step-by-step -step instructions that walk you through how to transform art materials into finished pieces of art that at the same time helped you calm down and helped you express your emotions. We offer affordable and flexible options. Our at-home box is $31 a month, our box for corporate teams is $36 a month. And if you're traveling, we have a mini on-the-go box that you can have for just $26 a month. Our customers are used to spending an average of $35 to $45 a month on the paint parties and art classes we offer in our art studio. Reviews show that our customers actually want a way to add art making into their daily routines after experiencing the stress-relieving approach that we take to art instruction in our studio. This made us pivot when we joined Georgia State's Main Street Sit Fund. Since I opened the business in 2016 with my last $50, we've experienced great profit margins. When we acquired an art studio in East Point in 2018, it gave us a space to engage with our customers and really get to know what they like. The Main Street Seed Fund helped us with marketing, but most importantly, it helped us do more customer discovery. Discovery showed that we should get about 42% of our current customers to sign up for our box. The Seed Fund also helped us triple the amount of partners who are committed to pre-ordering our box when it's ready. The Seed Fund also helped us put together a dynamic team who will help us to ensure that this product is ethical, authentic, and credible. We're seeking $50,000 for manufacturing and marketing, but we're also seeking partnerships so that we can expand our reach and make sure people all over the world have access to therapeutic art activities so they can get ready to start their mental health journey. Thank you. So with our partners, we have 13 partners committed to signing up for the box, and that's to partner with us. That's mental health agencies, schools. We also have one military base, and we're working on a partnership with one of our newest clients, which is Delta, to, to be able to offer the box for teams, um, but also some of these partners, like a mental health facility services clients. So there, it would be for their clients, but also for their staff to be able to use with their clients as well. Sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's a really good question. We would, I would say out of the 4,000, I would say 65% of them are new customers, and I would say 35% of them are repeat. How did you connect sort of from a marketing perspective this whole mental health and art? So I, my master's is in psychology, but I'm also a professional artist. So in my work and in my, in my personal life, I also found that um, what they call art therapy um, can help people, you know, using the process of making art can help people calm down, can help people express emotions, can address certain mental health issues. So what, when our marketing, we're not just targeting people who have a diagnosed mental illness. Um, we do have options for them, but our goal is to teach people who just have daily stress, whether it's from work or from family um, or just, you know, uh, death in the family. Um, we have our boxes geared to address all of those issues. Thank you.
Thank you, Ashley. Next up, we have Beyond the Classroom, uh, co-founder and CEO, Bayina Jihad. She started her first after-school program when she was in elementary school. And here she is, Bayina Jihad. From my experience as an educator, each year I notice a large number of students entering my third grade class reading below grade level. And after talking to my colleagues and doing research, I realized it wasn't a district issue or a state issue. It's actually a national problem. And we can fix this. Hi, my name is Bayana Jahad, and I am the founder of Beyond the Classroom. I would like to introduce you to Dylan. Dylan entered my program because he lacked reading confidence and he was reading below grade level. Dylan would do anything to avoid reading, even chores. Unfortunately, this is not just a Dylan problem. This is a problem for 65% of third graders who read at first or second grade reading level. So how do we support Dylan and students like Dylan? Simple, we're beyond the classroom. We, we improve literacy rates with our one-on-one -on -one personalized coaching. We first connect students to their virtual literacy coach through their video and audio platform. We have a growing diverse content of magazines, books, articles to ensure students to become a real lifelong reader. We have two forms of measurements, fluency and comprehension, to make sure they're making progress. We're not the first in this educational space, but what differentiates us from our competitors is our content, our coaches, our guaranteed success, and our measurements. Within nine weeks, Dylan was able to make a 30% increase in his fluency and comprehension. And as far as confidence goes, let's just say instead of running away from reading, Dylan's reading bedtime stories to his parents. We offer two plans, a family plan, which is $100 a month, and an organization and school plan, which is a per student rate. What we've done so far has been amazing. In June, we launched our website and our parent beta. In October, we launched our social media campaign to promote literacy at home. In November, we launched our second parent beta. And based on that data, we decided to pivot and focus more on B2B, which is foundations, schools, corporations, and after school programs. We communicate with over 20 schools. We gained 10 partnerships, and we service over 85 students. Our goal is to impact on a national scale. But as we continue to go, grow, our focus on Metro Atlanta area. And by the end of 2020, service at least 3,000 students. Our next step is to build our automated platform, secure three summer programs, and to continue developing our 5K curriculum. Again, my name is Bayana Jahad. I'm a Teach for America alum, a Georgia State grad, and a former Fulton County educator. And my team is comprised of experts in business, educational, and un education entrepreneurship. My ask is for you to join our community of readers. We're looking for clients, referrals, and partnerships. Thank you. Good job. The, the problem is clear. How will families or institutions afford it in a funding environment that is very difficult? So two things. Georgia, we have a what we call 21st century grant in Title I schools, and they're funding specifically for tutors and enrichment programs. For parents, our goal is to definitely deal with um, trying to reduce the cost, but as we continue looking at ways to reduce the cost from foundations and subsidations, uh, we want to try to definitely look at schools and after school programs to help funnel in that cost. The targets are those students, that 65% students that, that can't or aren't meeting the grade level. Yes. Do, do they often know that they're not even meeting the grade level? Do they know they need this tool? Yes, they do. So with schools, you know, you have your progress reports, you have your parent-teacher conference, you have a lot of ways that parents and schools connect with, a lot of ways that schools connect with parents. And immediately, within that first two to three months, schools and teachers are really going out there and telling the parents that they need support. And sometimes they just don't have affordable resources to access it. So how are you vetting the teachers that are on the support of coaching? Well, I have a network of educators. And what we do um, with being an educator, you have to get your certification. And one part of that certification is the background check, 
We also background check all our educators, and we're looking, we have college students, we have retired teachers, so we really vetted them because it's dealing with kids, and that's important, their safety. So we already show, our data is already showing that with our DRA uh, post and pre and post assessment. We show that a lot of the student, majority of the student, 30% of them, are making growth with their reading fluency and comprehension. Do you have a way to track that long term or a specific period of time versus just during the time of use? Yes, we do. So we want to definitely continue having the schools to go, be able to um, give us information about where they are. So even if they decide to not go with us or they decide to take a break, we can still ga gather that information and being able to track and see what resources, free resources, we can potentially give parents. Time. Thank you. Thank you, Baina. All right, uh, next up we have uh, Umama Kibria. Umama tells me that she can uh, squat 200 pounds. She's five foot tall, and that's 190 more pounds than I can squat. <laughs> she also tells me that last year she played flag football and had 14 sacks. Now, I've never had 14 sacks, but I've definitely been sacked more than that. Anyway, without further ado, here's Umama Kibria, co-founder CEO of Sweatpack. <laughs> Hi, I'm Umama, the co-founder and CEO of Sweatpack. It is so great to be here at Georgia State University where I first got a gym membership. Unfortunately, as soon as I started working out alone, anxiety took over, so I didn't end up using that membership. But that same fear continued as an adult. This time I was paying monthly for a membership I wasn't using. Then I realized most adults are guilty for having a gym membership and not using it. 67% of people waste $1.8 billion annually on unused memberships. And typically, most fitness New Year's resolutions fail because people don't know what to do or they lack the accountability. But I finally figured it out. So after college, I started working out and sharing my journey on social media for accountability. I was recognized as Forbes 30 Under 30 and Fitness Influencer of the Year as I worked out at over 400 gyms and connected with over 100,000 people on social media. And I met all these people that were struggling. They were new to the gym, they were busy adults, or even former athletes. And they all wanted the same thing, community and accountability. But why was it so hard to find a flexible gym membership? That's why we developed Sweatpack. Sweatpack is an app that connects people to group workouts and sports leagues. We help people be active, stay accountable, and earn rewards, and gyms get reoccurring revenue. Sweatpack's powered by our two-sided marketplace. This uh, is composed of our hosts that list their open classes and set their own prices. Then we have our teams that uh, have six members, select a sports or fitness activity, and then set a schedule and invite their friends to work out with them weekly. Sweatpack is initially addressing the $390 million market with the attention to 13 million millennials. But our, our flexible gym membership actually appeals to every type of age group and our hosts. That's why we simply charge a 20% transaction fee. Unlike our competitors, we're focused on committed groups versus class hopping alone. That's why we have a 100% retention rate with our hosts. And we know this because we've done customer discovery for five years through our event series. So with the Main Street Entrepreneurship Seed Fund Grant, we are able to scale our technology from a website to our web app, and now we're in full app development. During this time, we had an invite-only beta with 1,400 paying members, and that brought in $25,000 in revenue. And more importantly, 85% of them signed on to sweat with us again. And we've gained national attention from this, from Forbes, Google, Mercedes-Benz Stadium, and Adidas. And it's because of this team that believes in the user experience as our number one priority. That's why Nike, Equinox, LA Fitness have all trusted us. Now we invite you to join us in our $200,000 pre-seed investment round to help us scale our technology, grow memberships nationwide, and bring talent here to Atlanta. So we invite you to come sweat with us. Thank you. You said a 20% transaction fee. 20% of what? 
Yes, so we have flexible mini memberships. So typically the prices are anywhere between $75 to $250 for a membership. So the gym gets 80%, we get 20%. Why would they go to the gym if they can go to their if they can form a group and uh, just do it together with their friends? Yeah, so the accountability piece of our technology is what actually uh, organizes the team for them. We get exclusive group rates from t people that don't explicitly give group rates out, and our technology makes sure that they actually check in for that accountability piece. We have a perks program as well, so now they're being rewarded from uh, our sponsors at Mercedes-Benz, at Adidas, and even restaurant partners. So there's three different ways to be able to get that. So is your pricing in addition to the gym's price? No, they come through us. They buy that eight week membership price. And then what we've seen is that 85% retention rate. So people are signing up again. And now what they're doing is adding a yoga membership with a flag football membership and buying both of those through us. Could you uh, talk a little bit more about the acquisition strategy that goes Absolutely. So from the demand perspective, from the consumers, right now we're going on a full grassroots campaign with organic marketing. Corporate wellness deals have been really great for us. That's how we sign those year-long contracts with them, as well as influencers. For us, I have a network of about 250 influencers already signed up through our program to lead and bring on five team members. So it's a very organic marketing chain. Now on the supply side, we have already 100 gyms in Atlanta signed up to be a part of our program. And it's really easy with our marketing tactics. Once people see what we're doing, gyms are signing on. It's a pretty quick and easy transition to get them on the platform. How yeah. do you deliver the classes who, who, and, and who gets paid? What about the cost side here? Yes, absolutely. So the gyms get paid for the sports leagues or for the gym side, and then we take a 20% transaction. Instructors? Uh, it could be instructors, it could be personal trainers, gyms, or sports leagues. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mama. All right, we got one more to go. Last but not least, our own native Atlantan, co-founder and CEO of Totem Agency, Ashley Richardson. Hi, I'm Ashley, co-founder and CEO of My Totem, the all-in-one instant branding solution for small businesses. Now, we are on track to have earned $28 million in recurring revenue by 2022 if we maintain our 10% growth rate each week from our launch. But before we get started, speaking to all the entrepreneurs in the room, I want you to think of a time when you first started your companies. If you were anything like me back in 2015, you probably thought long and hard about the idea. You probably wanted a visual identity that accurately represented your brand, something that felt right. And I did too. So I called up my local branding agency, and they quoted me at about five to six weeks and about $6,000 to complete my project. And this devastated me because I couldn't afford that, and I wasn't alone. Most small business owners cannot afford to professionally brand and market their companies, so they're stuck choosing generic alternatives and risk compromising credibility amongst their target audience. Digital content marketing has never been more important than now. But it's OK, because we have the solution. My Totem is a fast, affordable, all-in-one, easy-to-use, customizable branding solution that nurtures the business owner through each step of their marketing journey. It starts with a short questionnaire where you set key aesthetic preferences. And then, instantly, we match you with colors, fonts, and logo recommendations based off of your target demographic and industry. And it doesn't stop there. Month after month, we continuously recommend relevant content to you so that you can implement these designs. Our goal is to continue growing and reach small businesses all over the planet. But we're going to start with the first 5,000 largest US cities, less than a quarter of this $60 billion target market. Now, our business model is simple. We have a freemium version that collects ad revenue and a $15 a month subscription. We took the time to study each brand tech company in our industry, and we realized that all of them still require the user to design and customize these templates. But My Totem is different. We personalize the process for you because we believe that seamless, seamlessness is the core of good design. Now, six months ago, we had our first prototype, had 80 users on the platform, none of which were paying customers. 
But now, after six months, we've built our fully functional MVP, we've increased our revenue over 600%, and we are profitable. Mainstream entrepreneurship guided us through three iterations to finally find the formula our users love and trust. We are raising $250,000 for a one-year runway so that we can get to the next iteration of MyTotem. Now, my co-founder Kate and I know this problem oh too well because as you heard earlier, we've lived it. And between the two of us, we have over a decade of combined experience in branding, design, and technology. Welcome to automation. Branding agencies are a thing of the past. Join us and build your totem. Thank you. Yes. Is there an algorithm and is it proprietary? Yes, it's proprietary. It's an algorithm that we've created from our industry knowledge. Um, we've surveyed over a thousand people. We've uh, researched a lot of branding agencies and we just continue to refine the algorithms. Is all the content that you can create digital or can you create physical business cards? Uh, well, Otherwise. it's all digital, but we do we can plug into like companies like Vistaprint because they do do that digital on the front end, and then they go ahead and print and ship. So we plan to eventually integrate with these companies so that it's around the user instead of all of these different components. So um, today they have to fulfill it themselves, but you're going to connect into the back end. Today, if you were to print a product, you would need to go onto Vistaprint, upload your design, or pick one of their templates, customize it yourself, then print it out. And you would still have to pick which, which uh, marketing items you want, all types of stuff. But we know your company, and we'll be able to recommend it to you and already upload your logo and all your designs onto it. What's your sort of ideal customer profile? Like, who do you think is going to be the early adopters? I think early adopters would be branding agencies. They could really use this um, information internally um, to generate color schemes and um, fonts for their customers. But eventually, we're going to expand out to university design students. Um, they're most self-sufficient in content creation today. We believe that content creators are going to be everyone in the future because of the presence of Instagram. We have to create content all the time anyway. But um, eventually, from um, newbies, it's going to be small business owners, and then um, eventually everyone. So doesn't that mean the business model should be targeted at a different audience than just than, than ads and well, no, because the business owners need it the most now, but not all of them are online. So um, what they're willing to do, though, is they have internal teams. They're willing to buy their, they're the end users of this product, so they buy it, but they pass it on to somebody inside their team so that they can um, customize and, and publish their content on a regular basis. Okay. founders uh, during the company showcase um, and before we move on with announcing the, the winners um, I do want to recognize our final round judges so uh, Brent Waters and Sheila Georgia if you could please come up on stage we have a small gift for you is it the check <laughs> it's the check I want one of those and our other judge, Andrew Dorman, ha had to leave. Um, hey. um, but thank you very much um, to, to you all for volunteering. Great, job. Great job. Um, And thank you also to all of our uh, preliminary round judges um, who, who judged the first round. Oh, so, so next I would like to invite uh, Dean Rich Phillips up to the stage to help us recognize all of the companies who are part of the Main Street Entrepreneurs Seed Fund. Uh, so, main, so, so we're going to uh, present each of the Main Street founders uh, with plaques. And so Main Street founders, as I call your names, please join us on stage to be recognized. Art Hub, London, London Balbosa, and Rhythm Varsny. Bakari Tutoring and Health, Usama Mutali. <laughs> e 
Ego Drop, Nicole Toole, and Ashir Vasadaba. Famous joint company, Kak Yusef and Hasim Ado. <laughs> Inspire, James Okolo and Tim Soap. Never Been Standard, Micah Ford. <laughs> Nurture Skin Care, Adisawa Imafadin. Observe, Lawrence Chen, Nishant Sinha, and Chi Chi Wanko. Synchronicity, Amber Luter. <laughs> Quaint Revolt Media, Sasha Gay Trusty. Students expressing life through fashion, Janella Gunu. Now for the startup stage companies. Airlift, Shihan Khan. <laughs> Angel Assistance, Savannah Samples. Artsy Belly, Bella, I'm sorry, Artsy Bella, Ashley Darmala. Dar <laughs> Beyond the Classroom, Beyond the Jihad.
Deliver her femcare, Shantae Knox and Dia Davis. Kim New, Vishwa Mudiganda. And Viraj Patel. Natural Leaders Media, Daniel Fitch and Ron Emil. Sweatpath, Umama Cabria. <laughs> and last but not least, Totem Agency Company, Ashley Richardson and Catherine Shaw. Let's give our founders another round of applause. And now it's my pleasure to invite Georgia State Provost Wendy Hensel and special guest Marcus Ruzek from the Marcus Foundation to the stage to announce the three stage, seed stage companies and three startup stage companies that have been selected by our judges to receive an additional round of funding to support their businesses. when people want to know who winners are, I should talk for a long time <laughs> and keep you in suspense and let it grow. I want to take 30 seconds and tell you how impressed I was today listening to these pitches and the growth that so obviously occurred with the ENI group, your professors, the mentors, and each other. It was clear that you learned quite a bit from each other, and I was just blown away by the professionalism that I saw. You know, much of my job involves taking really complex problems that I didn't even dream of solving and taking little pieces of them and putting puzzles together. And watching you, that's what I saw. And so those skills that you are learning, that you are putting into practice, God bless you if you if it turns into a company that makes you multimillionaires. Remember Georgia State got you there. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say, even if it doesn't, wow, what skills you've learned that are transferable to literally any kind of job that you want to do. So absolute kudos to all of you. Those plaques were not consolation prizes. They were not, you, you participated trophies. They are absolute signals of achievement whether you win this competition today or not. So congratulations to all of you. All right, I know what you want. <laughs> all right, we're going to start with the Main Street Seed Company winners. In third place, who wins $2,500, it goes to EcoDrop, Nicole Tu, and is shared with seven.
congratulations. All right, and second place with a check of $5,000 goes to Bakar Tutoring and Health, Osama bin Take that one to the bank, though. I don't know if that'll work. All right, in first place, with a check of 7,500, goes to Art Hub. Another round of applause to all of our state governors. Okay, moving on to our Main Street startup companies. In third place, with an award of $5,000, goes to Sweatpack, Umama Kibra. place with a check of 7500 goes to Totem Agency Company, Ashley Richardson and Catherine Shaw. excitement? Because it's $10,000 this time. I think we all want a piece of that. I got to say I was particularly impressed with this presentation. First place goes to Artsy Bella. <laughs> Congratulations to all of the founders once again. Um, one more thing uh, before I let you go. Um, uh, th there are too many volunteers and faculty and staff to recognize individually. Um, and and it, uh, a program like this and an event like this um, takes a lot of people. And so I won't recognize everybody individually, but I do want to recognize um, Georgia State's Entrepreneurship Working Group um, who have been in involved in from the very beginning to develop this program. And, and to those of you who helped us select our, our 21 companies uh, to begin with, you 
did a great job. Um, to the uh, entire Entrepreneurship and Innovation Institute faculty, staff, and entrepreneurs and residents, MK and Jameen, um, a lot of credit goes to you for, for helping these founders get to where they are. Um, and also want to want to thank Robin Morris and Barth Partha Sarathi who have been um, advisors uh, to me and in, in building this program and and, um, and and all of our senior leadership who's truly been um, supportive um, in helping us build this program. Um, so with that, this concludes um, our first ever Main Street Entrepreneur Seed Fund Demo Day. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening.